fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Uh, Dave Martino. Hello, hello. Yeah, it's quiet today. <laughs> yeah. Now it's the day after the day after the hangover after your birthday. Yes. So now it's quiet. It's it's very quiet. Soup. Very tea. quiet. Soup. Tea. Right? Yeah. Ice. Yeah, hangover. It's tough at your age. You know? <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, it's there's got to be a point where you stop celebrating birthdays. I mean, I did. No, no. I, no. Oh, please. Come I on. did back in, when I was 40. You know, I just make it 39 every year, just like Jack <laughs> Benny. <laughs> Again, nobody knows Again. who Jack Benny Jack... is. <laughs> no, I'm too that, old. And everyone's like, "Who's who's this Jack Benny <laughs> fellow?" You know, nobody has any history anymore. No, they don't. No, he's not on TikTok. He doesn't exist. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, he didn't appear at the Grammys. So no, <laughs> I, 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 he can't be real. You know, <laughs> that's great. Anyway, um, well, let's see. Now we've got a returning author today. Um, he's been around the block several times, um, and this time he's gone back into uh, the fiction writing. I think it's been 20 years. I think it was uh, it's quite a while ago. It's um, maybe not quite. I don't know. But anyway, let's talk to him. So, Mr. Ron Francel, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Al. Dave, don't worry about the age thing. <laughs> He doesn't. I try not to. No, I don't. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. But he pays for it, you know. Um, yes. You know, my birthday, I'm in bed at nine. Jeez. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so what's what's going on with you now, Ron? So the last time we talked, you were doing true crime. You've been doing true, true crime for a while now. So now you've you've done fiction before, and now you've gone back into it. Um, why the why the flip back? Well, you know. A good question. Uh, you know, because we've talked about them, books like Shadow Man and The Darkest Night are, are the product of kind of an old school research and investigation. Um, I'm an old school journalist. Uh, I, I believe in firsthand, up close sensory experiences that tell me everything I want to tell a reader. I write narrative nonfiction, and, and so I'm telling these true stories um, with some tools from the novelist's toolbox, like foreshadowing and character development and things like that. And it's an experience for the reader that relies heavily on the tiniest details of what I can see and hear and taste and so on. I can only get that from being having my boots on the ground in the places where it happened, talking to the people who were who maybe lived through it. Um, that's, that's a richness that set my true crime apart from some more formulaic stuff. Then comes COVID <laughs> <laughs> suddenly in lockdown. I can't book a hotel room. I can't dine out in a restaurant. I can't, get on an airplane i can't go into a courthouse or a library and i certainly can't talk to all those people that i need to talk to for my true crime i locked myself in my office with 40 years of experience in journalism and true crime storytelling and i imagined this new book death row uh, as you pointed out it's been a little more than 20 years since i've written fiction uh, so it, it was a little bit of a change, but it was made necessarily made necessary by COVID. Right. You know, the, the, the thing that I always find curious, because when you write true crime, you are, like you were saying, out meeting people, you're, you're going through the story, 
um, sometimes through the eyes of, of victims' families and sometimes uh, even through the, the criminals or the accused. And uh, there's a lot of real people, and you have to try to yeah. cover cover it all, or as completely as you can to make it a, a full story. But when you get into fiction, um, those people aren't real. And uh, we talk to a lot of fiction writers and quite a few of them will talk about how they hear voices in the head and they'll see their <laughs> characters and it's like watching a movie and they have these elaborate descriptions of, you know, of their creation to write a book. And I always find that weird because I've always stuck with nonfiction. So that just sort of seems kind of bizarre. But how is it for you? Because now you, you've done both. Um, is there a, is there a big difference in, in your character design? Um, yes, uh, obviously, for the reasons you just said, fiction often starts with the question, what if, uh, true crime starts with what is, <laughs> and so you're adjusting to that reality all the time. And I've heard a lot of writer, writers say that they carry on conversations with their characters. I, I think it's last study I saw of that, it was, you know, more than half. It's like two thirds of the authors say that their characters speak to them while they're writing um, or can act independently. When I hear a fellow writer say stuff like that, I usually take a subtle step backward. Uh, you know, hearing voices in your head is a symptom of schizophrenia. And yeah. I just don't want to take any chance. <laughs> But I, I, I do admit that I behave on my character's behalf. I, I think about it this way. We all imagine hearing the voices of other people when we think about how an argument might have gone differently or how someone we know is likely to respond to the news we're about to give them, right? Uh, that's just normal. In my case, my imaginary characters live the life that I give them and no more. I'm sometimes surprised by what my subconscious produces, but I'm not possessed or surrounded um, or even dependent on my characters. I don't feel their physical pre presence. I, I don't smell them. I don't hear them. I don't, you know, I don't want to touch them for the most part. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind who's in charge. So, uh, but the fact is, yeah, it is a little different because, like I say, when you go through a lifetime, not just of true crime, but as a journalist, you, you have this kind of driving ethical sense about the the truth and fairness. And then suddenly you're writing a novel. It, it's different. <laughs> I mean, it, you, you, the truth and fairness are what you define them to be. Uh, for that story. So, no, I, I will say that this, that when I write my true crime, I'm trying to employ some of those techniques of fiction writing, like I talked about foreshadowing and character development and things like that. So, so I already am writing in a story form that's familiar. It's just odd when I come up against a problem and in my true crime, I would say, well, this is a true, this is a, a problem in truth. I have to go find out what's real. Where in fiction, you're saying, uh, I'm in a corner here. Oh, well, I'll just make something up, you know? <laughs> so it is different. It is different. Well, at least you're not waking up in the middle of the desert one night and bloody hands and a shovel and hearing voices. So that's, that's kind of a good thing. That's a relief. Well, that one time, you know, <laughs> you keep bringing that up. Well, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's an important thing you need to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, that's a different story. Well, I think the, the other thing in fiction too is the fiction, in a sense, like maybe maybe I'm overstating, but I think that um, a lot of people in North America, period. A lot of us are probably feeling that the you know there isn't a really strong sense of of good justice being applied in real life, you know like there's you know how many times do you hear stories of uh, 
you know, someone that's done some horrendous crime and they get four years or something. And meanwhile, someone with pot in their car has got 20 years. Like we hear a lot of these yeah. stories. And yeah. so I think there's a lot of times people feel, well, there's no justice. And a lot of times this is true because, like, you know, you've written true crime, you follow it. And, and there are times when the bad person didn't really get what they deserved and and for different reasons and um at least with fiction uh, you can have a sense of justice you can have a complete ending or it, it may not be tidy but at least there's a you know a, a sense of accomplishment in a sense yeah sure and and i think you're right i think justice exists more than the media and particularly the internet media would lead us to believe um it, it, it's, I go back to my journalism training. Uh, we don't cover the uh, hundred thousand airplanes that took off safely today. Right. We're writing about the one that didn't. And I think the same is probably true in questions about justice uh, or in crime in general, really. We are not writing about the guys who got exactly what was coming to them. Uh, for doing a crime that probably was a lot like the last time that crime happened. Um, it's just not news anymore. But right. when, when an Idaho, um, a batch of Idaho, uh, co-eds are killed and the killer disappears, um, a, a nation is riveted. Uh, it's, it, it's, slightly unusual i mean you think of crimes like the richard speck murders in chicago in the 60s where he murdered the nurses student nurses um it it it, it kind of echoes that but it, it's a different kind of crime it's not what i would call a, a garden variety murder and so we get riveted to it and when it the cops are a little slow to nail down who it might be, uh, we start to think the cops are outmatched. Or when five cops beat a man to death in Memphis, we um, we tend to, to 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 project that brutality on all cops. It's just not true. And in, yeah. in my true crime, I've written a lot about these dogged detectives who can't sleep at night because of cases that are haunting them. Uh, and now in death row, um, I'm writing about a cop who's retired and wants wants nothing more than to just fade away and and live out the rest of his life and not come into contact with too many humans. Uh, when he gets dragged into a case and he has the ability to say no, but it's something inside him that's driving him that says, this is what you do. This is, this is kind of your purpose in life. This is, you're good at it. So see if you can help. And that's the kind of detective that I've written about in real life. And some bits and pieces of all those real details detectives that i've written about might have found their way into him yeah i would say um I, you know i would ask like who who was the inspiration for this or did you have one you know and that's kind of a, a touchy uh it could be a combination of a lot of people i guess it, it was a combination in his case it was a combination of a lot of people um and i i i can't really say it was one person. I mean, I I have his look uh, suggests one guy. Uh, his manner suggests another. So he he's a kind of uh, pastiche of, of 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 a lot of different people. And 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 you know, fictional characters are kind of like that. I mean, you know, creating a character can touch readers. Um, and, but it's harder to do than it looks, you know, yeah. so, so ordinary people aren't always perfect for fiction, but, um, I want readers for a few hours at least to consider that people, characters like 
would Robel, the hero of Death Row, and the old guys on Death Row, uh, I want them to be considered as secret friends. I, I want them to be a little melancholy when the readers put the book down because they don't want those guys to go away. Those are the kinds of characters I'm trying to create. They're all unique. I'm, I'm proud to say that every one of the old guys who make up this little coffee club called Death Row uh, know exactly who Jack Benny was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how could they not? I yeah, mean, that's right. Know. That's right. Perfect. I'm just watching. <laughs> I've been watching him last week. So, <laughs> my, uh, what, how do you get into the mindset then? Um, because you're not, you know, hanging out with these people. So, and and you got to make them sound real, and you got to have real actions and reactions, and and the way people talk and that. The details have got to be pretty, um, you know, fit who the character is and what situation they're in and, and the reactions have got to be good. You know, otherwise people lose, you know, interest or they don't, they don't believe a character so much. So um, I can see getting into the cops character in a sense, because you've dealt with probably a lot of cops over right. the years, right. a lot of policing and stuff like that, that, that sort of fits and you can draw on your experience. But I wonder with um, some of the, filler characters or some of the other ones that y you wouldn't really relate to because you're not them and you haven't right. really how how do you fill in their conversations well let me let me first start by saying describing this a little so the listeners understand what i'm talking about when i answer your question the, the death row is a mystery and it's about a, a retired Denver homicide detective who re, who goes to the mountains and wants to be alone. He wants to serve out the rest of his life uh, quietly and, and with as little disruption as possible. When he is brought into this case by a friend, a pre a retired priest, his closest friend, um, he doesn't he doesn't want to do it. But part Part of it is that he doesn't have the resources that he once had as a Denver homicide detective. Um, he, he doesn't have the high tech forensics. He doesn't have uh, the team at work. He doesn't even have the support of the local cops who could help him by answering a few questions. Uh, anybody who's been a journalist knows that local cops don't want to share any information of, with anybody. So, what he does have is this little coffee club of old guys in their 70s and 80s who get together every morning um, like this happens every in every little town across America. Uh, and they solve the problems of the world. They poke fun at each other. They uh, are old guys and they they sense um, that that. Um, maybe the world that maybe the important part of life has already passed and they're just waiting around. And, and as we, some of us know, um, sometimes guys get older and they start to turn invisible. Nobody sees them anymore. And so that's what we have. And, and so we have our, our retired homicide detective, Woodrow Bell, his best friend, Father Bert, and then five or six old guys in in this coffee club and they call themselves deaf row not death as in dying but deaf as in i i can't hear you <laughs> deaf yeah. row okay so to your question uh father burt is a great example i'm not a priest i'm not a catholic uh uh i had to go and find somebody who could talk to me um fairly frankly, about some of the characteristics of this guy, who I imagine to be kind of an unorthodox priest. He's he's full of life, and he's got these quirky behaviors. He hunts, he drinks, he's mildly profane, and he's, he's as rebellious as he is faithful, and that rebellion has been why he was assigned to this dead end parish in the mountains. He and, and Bell share a lot of characteristics. Uh, although father Bert tends to be, um, uh, Bell's, 
uh, conscience um, and, and appeals to that. But again, I'm not Catholic, and I wanted to know how far we could go to create a believable character who has some of those quirks that I was talking about and not be a cartoon. So uh, there you go. I have to go find somebody. And one of the hardest things for me in, in writing fiction was finding somebody who will play along. I'd imagine it would be easy to find a priest who could tell you no good priest would do any of the things that you imagine. <laughs> yeah. I, and so the game is over that we, we can't play. I need to find one who says, okay, well now here's how he might justify that. And here's, here's what scripture says that might justify that. And here's what the Pope thinks that might justify that. Um, so it, it, a lot of that, when I'm dealing with people outside of my own personal experience, I, I have to go find somebody and I have to ask some really weird questions. But a writer is a collector of all these little artifacts that make us human. You know, we, we, uh, we're, we're always observing. We're always eavesdropping. Certainly in a lifetime as a journalist and a crime writer, I've seen some of the best and the worst we people have to offer um and that's where these guys all come from you know i'm wondering too if if you don't hear voices and <laughs> i'm one of those crazy writers who does okay never 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 be alone with that <laughs> no 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 take a step back but uh <laughs> i'm just wondering you know how do you uh, create dialogue are you pulling from conversations that you've heard are you uh, talking about being a collector of things? Is that is that how you do it? Do you have some process that you go through? Not really. I mean, in the sense that I don't have conversations with my characters, but like I say, I behave on their behalf. So I can drop into a conversation um, and and know the kinds of things that would normally be said. There, there are many conversations in Death Row one is um, our detective and our priest are in the priest's old uh, decrepit Bronco and they're going up a, a scary mountain road and they're having a conversation and the, 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 the detective is the passenger and he's a very bad passenger. He, he doesn't like <laughs> putting anything in anybody else's control, especially steering wheels. Um, and so, so their conversation is, is colored by his discomfort. Um, the, the, the priests, you know, I don't know, maybe faith in, in God, uh, in the, in the event that we crash and die. Uh, but, (laughs) But there's this conversation and, and at the beginning of the conversation, when I'm at the beginning of the writing of the conversation, I know I have to achieve something. I need to move them to a, a different spot physically. They, they're going to drive there, but I also need to get them. I need to, uh, to deliver some information to the reader during this, as well as giving some flesh to their to their characters to showing my control freak detective who's grumpy uh and to showing my my priest who has something else in mind and and probably isn't keeping his eye on the road Hmm. so I, i i i have to sit back like you would and say, okay, what what's likely to happen on such a journey? Uh, how's he likely to feel? How's the other guy likely to feel? How's that likely to come out? And especially if they're both men in their 70s or 80s, what's the kind of language they're likely to use with each other? It's been, it was an interesting thing I, uh, that I wanted to come out in the book, and I hope it did is um old men like that don't put their arms around each other and express their affection 
mm. the way maybe women would the way men in that certain age express their affection is through joking and sarcasm and poking and making fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a good deal of this book that's tied up in that kind of humor. Um, and again, putting, putting flesh on their um, literary bones, I guess. When you, when you're writing this book, um, I, 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 if I go back to true crime and, and even your journalism, you're trying to convey a point to the reader, right? You're, 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 you're hoping that they take something from your reporting. They learn something about the victim, maybe, or something about the situation. Yes. Um, and even in true crime books, you're, you're trying to, you know, get the, the, the real story out so people understand it. Do, do you find that when you're doing a fiction book like this, is is there a subtext or a meaning that you're hoping that a reader would get after they read it besides all the entertainment or the, the crime itself, like your, your mystery, but is there something else underneath? I think so. I, I think if uh, this death row is my 19th book. And I think that if I go back to my motivations on my very first no book, which was a novel, a literary novel back in the late nineties. Um, I, I very specifically had a message that I thought I wanted to get across. Uh, I equally quickly learned that um, it doesn't matter what I want you to take away. You might, you might get it, but everybody has their own interpretation of every piece of art. Um, I, I'd imagine that Picasso had something in mind for most of his paintings and was probably surprised when people came up to him and said, oh, well, yeah, that's a cow juggling a beach ball. Uh, I, I have surrendered now, 19 books later, to the idea that, yes, I want there to be something of value to a reader something that, that sticks long past the, the book going back on the shelf. Uh, I'm just, and, and I might even have an idea about what I would like it to be, but I'm satisfied to know if it, it, that I'm, I'm satisfied by them taking away any message. Having any message is better than closing the book and saying, well, that was, that was brain candy. That, yeah. that 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 was fine. What's next? And it doesn't stick. My favorite books, um, and or my favorite thoughts about books and readers are the ones where a reader has said to me, "I'm here. I am ten years later, and I can't shake that character." And and that's important to me. I introduce them to somebody worth knowing. And and placing humor in places, do you, I mean, that's got to be timed like a comedian, right? You know, uh, especially in a crime story involving children, I would imagine. Yeah, in, um, in, this, in this case, the, the humor has, um, has a role, of course. Um, I, you know, in, in the crimes in Death Row are so ghastly that, uh, a lot of the humor is intended to give the reader a, a kind of an emotional break from the tension and from the heavy mood that that's being painted otherwise. Uh, also, comedy can intensify the tragedy that is about to happen. So I, I saw a lot of uses for it there, not only painting these guys realistically. In some cases, I use lines that I have heard my father say or my father-in-law or some old guy that that was just hilarious. But, you know, we all like to smile and we tend to like people who make us smile. So humor, I hope, endears us to these old guys. I want readers to like them. I want them to care about what happens to these these old guys. Um, and when you care about somebody, the stakes become clear and they become personal 
and the story becomes meaningful, getting back to that exact thing that we just talked about, yeah, leaving the reader with something to think about. Well, I'm wondering, with, with guys in their 70s and 80s joking around, um, you know, they're from a different time. I'm, I'm 52, and I'm from a different time, so I'm wondering, uh, do, do you worry about uh, self-censoring, or do you worry about political correctness? Uh, do you need to self-censor with these characters and, and uh, their band? You know, I, I worry about it. I, <laughs> I don't do it enough, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I worry about it in the sense that I don't want them saying something that I just, I think is awful, uh, uh, mainly because I, I want people to, to find them endearing. Uh, I don't want them standing up and using the N word or, um, you know, anything, any hot button thing like that. Uh, that that is going to turn off a reader. That doesn't mean that it doesn't come out in some ways, that these are conservative guys who've lived a, in a different time, doing different things and expressing themselves in different ways. But I don't, I, I, uh, unless in a future story uh, involving these guys, race is an issue i can't see them standing up and and uh, hollering you know the n-word or anything i i so in a sense the answer is yeah i a little bit but it's just the story doesn't need to go there and uh, now that said i'm 66 myself um and i uh, you know there I occasionally say things that people say, well, you can't say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I wasn't aware I couldn't say that. Mm -hmm. So maybe that happens, there. but, but nothing, nothing horrible. Yeah. I get accused of that all the time. I mean, I, I turn 60 <laughs> and I say things all the time on air and get letters. Well, emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know. You know, I just um, certainly my again, you, you know, the intention isn't there to hurt someone and the intention isn't to be um, mean or make someone feel bad. So I think that's kind of how I address it. It's, it's you know, if you if you make a mistake, you apologize or if someone corrects you on something, then, OK, now I understand. You know, I don't know. Um, and that said, though, I, and Dave makes a good point, um, I think we live in um, hypersensitive times. Uh, I posted a thing in my social media about the Chinese spy balloon, and I, uh -oh. I'm i just waiting for somebody <laughs> to come back and say that that was an, yeah. uh, an anti-Asian yeah. uh, thing or something. It, it, just because the word Chinese is in there doesn't mean this is commentary on Asians. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and yet I think we've seen that very thing happen. Uh, so... Uh, if you live in hypersensitive times, I guess you have to be prepared to hear from hypersensitive people mm. about uh, offenses that might or might not be there. I guess that remains to be seen. Death Row comes out on February 14th, next Tuesday, one week from today. Yeah. Um, and I suppose on Wednesday, I'll be hearing from all the people who think that something one of these guys said went over the line. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we'll get our listeners on that. Like, please, let, yeah, him, yeah. let him know right away so he knows, right? Like, he, he wants yeah. to hear this. The email, <laughs> just put my email there in the uh, notes. Yeah, yeah, just do that. And, uh, you know, inundate him. Make sure he understands. <laughs> Al sends all his picketers to me. To my yeah. I'll give you Stephen King's email address. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Send your complaints to him. Yeah, yeah, Dave. I just send them to me, and I'll give you Dave's address. You can go. Perfect. <laughs> you know, he likes. I'm it. used to it. Yeah. Well, that's it. so. When you take the subject matter, like this is kind of an unsolved um, crime of you know a, a child murder, and so that's a very kind of popular topic not necessarily child murder but the unsolved crimes and people trying to solve right, crimes right. you know it seems to be a big trend 
Um, what what got you into this sort of story? Was it based on something that you've had experienced before or another crime somewhere that maybe was not solved and stayed with you? There originally, you know, I was I was enchanted by this idea. An elderly friend of mine was telling me one day he lives in Washington state was, was telling me about his morning coffee club and that they called themselves death row. And all of a sudden, literally in a flash, in a blink, a story, I, a story popped into my head about, and, 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 and I should say the broad strokes of a story because I wanted uh, at that point, there would be a mystery. These guys would help in solving it and they would each have these individual traits and skills uh, that were can, that would contribute. When it came time to think of, okay, where do I place this story? Where, what crime do I explore? I went back to the little town in the Colorado Rockies where I lived when I was a senior writer at the Denver Post. And and there's this idyllic little town, uh, just perfect. And so I I kind of transmogrified it into the fictional Midnight Colorado. The crime itself was actually inspired. The, the crime in the book was inspired by an, a real life crime, where a teenage girl, uh, much like the teenage girl in Death Row uh, goes missing and nobody ever knows what happens to her. And I think that was about a 30 or 40 year old crime at the time I was living in this little town, but it was still a topic of conversation. Small towns have very long memories. And uh, in this particular case, the, the disappearance of this little girl, they're not little girl, teenage girl really uh, stuck. It really stuck in the in the memory and the imagination of this little town, and people still talked about it. So I wanted to use that in Death Row, and now now I've fictionalized some of the details of it. Um, but it was the idea that the disappearance of a teenage girl in a small town is a very different event. Uh, than the disappearance of a teenage girl in a big urban center like New York or Denver or L.A. Uh, it's not going to stick to the memory. It's not going to be on the front page. The uh, local paper won't do the occasional um, 40 years ago, this girl went missing. There, it, none of that would happen. And the, the comings and goings in a big city that just, have it, it just makes for a different kind of memory small towns are different and so that was a big part of it i wanted um i i wanted to to, to explore the kind of of thing that um you know affects a small town it affects a close-knit community and so really that's where that all came from and uh, of course in death row um, they hurtle toward solving it uh, in real life. That girl was never found. Was that friend um, in Washington, um, Jack Benny? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Jack Benny's dad. Oh, <laughs> oh just a young, young... <laughs> His elderly dad. Yeah, his elderly, yeah. yeah. That's another word that doesn't get used, elderly. Elderly. Oh, people don't use well, that. Well, I could have used... I could have used the words old farts. I just, don't yeah. know what you, your, your, your listeners might be gentler than that. Oh, da I doubt it. <laughs> I, I, I read some of the emails. No, uh, gentle is not the word I was thinking, but well, that's it. The whole thing is that is true. You know, an old town does have a sense of memory and maybe it's just because, um, small towns have, um, less people and they're closer connected. Maybe there's just too many murders in a big city over years. Yeah. You all know? those things. Yeah. All those. Things. And, and that has popped up in my true crime. Certainly my very first true crime, the darkest night is about 
uh, a crime against two sisters, literally my next door neighbor girls, um, in a small town in Wyoming where I grew up, uh, and and how that affected not only their family but the the kids around them and the community, the the, the small town in general. Um, and I used a lot of that feeling in in death row uh same thing was true in shadow man how the small town of manhattan montana uh you know 50 years later still considers um considers the crimes that i described in that book the crimes that led to the fbi issuing its very first criminal profile they still consider that current events and and uh, that's just a reality. And so uh, that was just a reality that I wanted to capture in death row, that this small town would, um, it, this would be a fresh wound. This would be an, uh, uh, an open wound for this town decades later. Do you, do you find the process of writing uh, true crime to fiction, is it, is it really different and, uh, do you enjoy one better than the other? Uh, in my career, uh, let's see if I can, if my 66-year-old memory serves me. I've written a literary novel, a few mysteries now, a road trip memoir, and more than a dozen true crime books. Uh, I've probably written a thousand newspaper articles, three screenplays, uh, countless blogs, uh, a couple poems. Pretty lazy. <laughs> <laughs> what I've learned in in that chaos is that each genre has its own unique conventions. Think of it this way: an, a, a news anchor woman, a songwriter, a poet, a film director. They're all storytellers. They might all have a special affection for language, uh, but what about being an anchor woman makes her a good poet? What, what about being a filmmaker makes him a natural songwriter? Well, there's not a damn thing. And so it is with writing true crime and crime fiction. Uh, the leap might not be that great between, uh, you know, fake and real crime, uh, but the realms of nonfiction and fiction are completely separate universes. Um, you know, I think in some ways a true crime writer has an easier job. He doesn't have to imagine the plot, the characters, the setting, a message, anything except the structure of the story. Uh, on the other hand, the mystery writer isn't, really constrained by what actually happened and can solve a lot of predicaments by simply imagining a solution. Um, I, I think a big difference comes when you tell a reader up front, this is a true story. Or conversely, this is completely made up. Fiction writers will give an author, I think, a wide berth. They, they suspend their disbelief and they allow the storyteller some leeway between what's likely and what's possible. Um, a nonfiction writer, though, tells you on the cover, this is a true story. So readers don't suspend that disbelief and they don't give permission to be kind of elegantly gaslighted on this. You know, they're they're quick to declare the author to be a lying charlatan uh, and throw the book across the room. Um, uh, it's why I think we can love a movie about blue people in a different universe, but be angry with the TV weatherman. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's what we're prepared to absorb and believe for the sake of being entertained. Um I so I've written both true crime and crime fiction. I can't really declare one is easier than the other. They they're as different to me as writing a history book or a song. They're both hard. If a beginning writer asked me what should she pick, I'd say it doesn't matter. 
Uh, I tell her to become a student of the form and learn everything she can about how it's done. And then the rest is easy. You just sit down at your word processor and let the processor and let the blood ooze from your forehead. <laughs> yeah. Story of story of life of a writer, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> am, am I right? Exactly. <laughs> well, he's insane. Yeah. Well, that's all true. All sorts of stuff going on. Well, that helps. Yeah. It like, he doesn't hurt. <laughs> just, he doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> or where he's at, you know, in the story or in real life. So, mm, that's yeah, true. There's the choice. Well, and do, do you um, do the insane things sort of around in your life, and and things do things affect you in your writing? Are you are you that guy that can't write when there's something stressful going on, or are you just very organized and you can just sit down and nine to five and just pump it out? I, I consider it a job. I I try to work literally eight hours a day when I'm writing. And and that can be writing, it can be researching, uh, and it can be longer. But I try a minimum of eight hours a day. I try to treat it like a job. And I think a lot of my um, my feelings about what's going on around me come from my newspaper days where you had to tune that out. I mean, there's a whole newsroom of people around you and they're clattering and phones are ringing and they're yelling and they're talking and people are moving and you just have to tune that out and focus. So I think that part of it uh, has not been somebody asked me recently, well, you know, whether it's fictional or, or true, um, did, did, did you ever get splashed by the darkness of your subjects? I mean, are you affected by that? And I, my answer was something like, you know, 40 years I've compartmentalized my emotions so that I can tell these kinds of stories, whether it's books or newspapers, it doesn't matter. The sight of a dead child to me it, it it touches a deep down part of me. Uh, but the best thing I can do is tell her story. I, I not stand there crying about it. Um, a whole family killed by a drunk driver, their bodies might still be there in the wreckage. That tightens my jaw to the point. I think my teeth might break, but weeping wouldn't, would make me look away. And if I'm going to tell that story, I can't look away. So I think when I was younger, it was easier to be kind of stoic. Um, I guess I could afford to only worry about the story. Now I'm old. Uh, I know Jack Benny. <laughs> I write books about uh, ordinary people. <laughs> <laughs> who shouldn't have died. Uh, but sometimes he died in spectacularly grisly ways. Um, sometimes I want to cry, uh, but I can't without losing some of the spark that I should be putting into words about them and not weeping. So I keep, I wrote a blog recently about this in my life. It's at my website. It's called Cry Later. And because I keep telling myself, I'll cry later. Right now I have to tell this story. I'll cry later. The problem has been that later really never comes. Well, it sounds, it sounds like, you know, it's the same thing that uh, police and fire and EMTs have to go through and Absolutely. Have, to, have to put up that wall to some extent to be able to get their job done. That, and that's right. If you're going to be up to your elbows in blood and gore, if you're going to see things that normal people don't want to see, um, but you have to describe it, uh, you have to be able to compartmentalize uh, the, the, the ghastliness. Um, I did a book a few years ago called Morgue, A Life and Death. I wrote it with one of the world's most renowned medical examiners, Vincent DeMaio. And it was about some of his classic, uh, f most fascinating cases. Uh, he exhumed Libby, Lee Harvey Oswald. He did, worked on the Phil Spector murder case. Um, he even rendered an opinion uh, about the death of Vincent Van Gogh. 
uh, for the time that I was researching that book, I'm, I'm li- literally surrounded by boxes and boxes of morgue and autopsy records. And they're filled with photos that nobody really should have to look at. Um, but to me, they were just boxes of stuff I had to look through in order to be able to tell the story. There are so many people in our world, the cops, the firefighters, the medical examiners, uh, the crime writers, uh, who do jobs that we don't want to do. And thank God for them. Uh, thank God for morticians, for God's sakes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you could still eat lunch, too, while you're doing Well, <laughs> you know, after a, a day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Steak on the grill. <laughs> mm. I uh, once was invited to be the only journalist to witness the exhumation of the 1950s pop star, the Big Bopper, J.P. Richardson. And they they brought him out of the ground and took him to a warehouse where uh after a time they opened the casket and 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 surprisingly he was in fairly good shape but it, it still wasn't pretty and um yeah so i spent the day in in a rather putrid environment looking at things that nobody should have to look at and when i got home my wife had uh so I, I'm sure it was boiled chicken for dinner. And uh, <laughs> so I went to bed without dinner. Mm. Oh, yeah. I guess he stopped singing. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. In case people don't know, we'll put up who the big bopper was. There you go. <laughs> yes. There you go. On the website. Yeah, just <laughs> well, Chantilly Lace. Everybody knows Chantilly Lace. Oh, uh, you think so? <laughs> or Jack Benny? Uh, Jack, yeah, they're yeah. That's we'll put him yeah, up too. Yeah, they. Um, are you kidding? Anyway, well, listen. Um, how do people find you? Um, social media, website. What do you got going on? Everywhere. Um, like I say, first Defro is coming out. Uh, it it launches on next Tuesday or February fourteenth whatever that might be when they hear the, your broadcast. Um, I have a website, uh, ronfrancel.com. I'm on all the social media. I invite people to look me up, uh, like me, friend me, whatever, whatever turns your crank. Uh, Call your name. <laughs> and, but I love interacting with readers. It's a privilege. You know, we, Dave and I probably spend a lot of our lives dealing with agents and editors and publicists and booksellers and distributors and all kinds of middlemen that stand between us and the readers when really we're we're doing this for the readers. And it's a privilege to, to be able to communicate directly with readers. So I invite people, please look me up and join the conversation. Fantastic. And and look for him on TikTok. You're on TikTok too? <laughs> no, I'm not on TikTok. No. Oh. Well that's, that's next. A, that's a just I have a face for radio. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, again, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, of course your new book, Death Row, will be out the fourteenth, and we appreciate you. So Ron Frenzel, thank you. And well thank you, Al. Thank you, Dave. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Ron. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.